Hello there, thanks for clicking on the video. If you like what you see here, be sure you subscribe and stick around to see what's coming up. I mean, 50,000 people can't be wrong. Oh, that's right. We just hit 50,000 subscribers on the channel, and I uh, just wanted to thank you guys before we jump into today's topic. I can't believe all you guys are here to listen to me ramble like a lunatic and tell some slightly inappropriate jokes about fuzzy animal people. As promised, since we've hit the 50k mark, the next Sonic video will be about Super Shadow, so stick around for that. In the meantime, enjoy the video. There are few things more exhausting than being a Sonic fan. Not only do we bicker and battle over video game mechanics, haircuts, eye colors, dimensions, we also bicker over which animal person the Blueberry Cyclops should shack up with. I sometimes wonder if uh, any of my real life friends or family are watching these videos and wondering, um, what I'm doing with my life. I've recently been diving into Sonic comics, and while I've gone on record saying I don't like a lot of the stuff from the early days over at Archie, and how much I enjoy the current IDW run, some folks have come to assume that that means I hate the characters brought in from the western side of Sonic media, and even one very specific chipmunk at the center of all of it. Princess Sally Acorn. Well, let me tell you up front, I think she is a great character, at least when used by talented storytellers. She's not perfect, and there are certain aspects of this character that a good chunk of folks just can't stand, but all in all, I'm of the opinion that she not only deserves the love she gets, but she deserves a whole lot more. So, yeah, I'm a fan of Sally. I guess you could call me a simp monk. There is a lot to unpack when it comes to Sally, but seeing as she has been around for as nearly as long as Sonic himself, I think it's best we start from the beginning. Sally, like a lot of Western Sonic characters, was inspired by one of the little animals Sonic would rescue from Badnik Innards. Sally specifically was formed from Ricky. Early on in a lot of Sonic Western media, they would identify Ricky as a female, name her Sally Acorn. And in some canons, that's where the story ends. The UK Sonic comic went off and did its own thing, the games never went any further than that little chipmunk that was rescued, and that's perfectly peachy by me. But over here, here in the States, they continue to refine Sonic's universe in their own way, building up a world and backstory that was radically different from what was found in the games, filling in gaps left by the core series. And it's not like you can really blame Sega for not wanting to go nuts with the lore. The focus was on gameplay, after all, so in turn, a lot of the designs of the enemies, levels, and the hedgehog himself were designed in service to the gameplay. And for a while, that's as deep as it needed to go. But with Sonic blowing up in a big, bad way, fans wanted to know a little more about the characters and the world they inhabited. And the media outside of the games was happy to provide. The strange, unique world got a name, Mobius. The rings found an origin with Sonic's uncle Chuck. Also, Sonic has an uncle now. Robotnik had a rise to power and a far more imposing grip than he ever did in the games. Even the little animals stuffed into robots served as inspiration for a far more terrifying process, robotization. Instead of generating machines, these humanoid animals were transformed into robotic slaves. All these elements were further defined, and so too were the cast created to support Sonic, and no character was better to find than Sally. And that's because it was decided that Sonic needed a girlfriend. Kinda makes you wonder what they would have done with Cucky if they evolved him along those lines. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess they kinda already... <clears throat> Sorry, Antoine. Giving Sonic a love interest has been an idea that's been thrown around since the very conception of the game series itself, but in that case, it was a busty human lady named Madonna. Now we all know that Sonic's flirtations with hairless apes would continue to be a long-standing tradition of the franchise, but as the vision of the original game took shape, this was dropped. Still, the idea of a human girlfriend would be one of the many, many concept designs for Sally. The Western world was determined to hook up Sonic, and they went through a lot of changes to get her to the point that would make sense for her to be a partner for Sonic. And it feels weird talking about women in fiction in this way, even animal ones, so I apologize if this sounds gross. But if you want Sonic to fall for this gal, you gotta get the fans to fall for her first. Seriously, out of all the Freedom Fighters and the extended cast from the world of Sonic, none have the extensive backstory as fleshed out as Sally. And in certain cases, not even Sonic himself gets this much attention. Even when they got something out the door in terms of a design, they still kept twiddling around with the colors. She was blonde with red fur for a mini comic series, then pink with black hair, which would remain for the pilot of the Sad AM series and the first year of Archie Comics. Pink Sally, while not my favorite design, certainly feels a little more in line with the more stylized critters of the games, but her personality was still not as refined as it would be. In the pilot, she was still smart and capable, but she was missing something. Ah, there it is, sex appeal. 
I am not kidding. Look, I know she looks like a Funko figure with Bambi eyes, but listen to her voice actor, Kath Susie, playing Pink Sally. Sonic, are you gonna help us? And now listen to her playing the finalized design of the character. That it is, my pretty! Oh, sorry, wrong sound clip. Coming back to rescue me was very brave, Sonic. Susie is a damn good voice actor with an amazing range. But is it any surprise she would later go on to voice Lola Bunny? Don't ever call me doll. I seriously doubt she'd have the same appeal if her voice was like this. You okay? Many have proclaimed that Sally is the source of all of furrydom, which, while I'm not an expert on that particular culture, she was clearly designed to be attractive. That doesn't mean I'm gonna have very confused feelings for a chipmunk every time it crosses my path, but these are intentional design choices. As Pink, her hair was a solid black, usually up in a ponytail or headset, or I don't know, sometimes it's just like that. And she has a little heart shape on her chest fur, but otherwise she still had that weird toddler potato body like the other characters. But then they went and gave her dark eyelids that look a lot like eyeshadow, almond-shaped eyes, and an hourglass shape to that little body under that giant head. And her hair just looks a little wilder. A little more rebellious, with that bang dipping down over her face. Just a really strong 90s hairstyle. Also, weirdly, one of the few female Sonic characters without clothes. Like, this girl could make Alvin and his brothers completely forget the Chipettes even existed. Also, quick tangent here, I don't know why it always bothered me as a kid that Alvin and the Chipmunks were just Chipmunks in this standard human world, yet they were like three feet tall. And children, like, were they gonna grow up to be human size? Like, it made no sense to me as a kid, but at the same time, I was completely fine with Sonic being the same size as a rabbit and a fox and a coyote and a walrus, and all of them are still, like, up to Robotnik's thighs. Maybe it's because Alvin was in the human world? I don't know, man. Whatever the case is, Alvin would still be simping for Sally, I can guarantee you that. I guess you could call him a simp monk. And to those of you saying that we just want Sally back because we're just really creepy about the character, Fair point. I went on extensively about how sexualized they made the initial design of the character. And I won't deny that a lot of the fans probably want her back because they're probably simp mo That aside, there isn't a single Sonic character that can escape the dreaded perversion of a lot of the fan base. There's no two ways around that. And I don't think a character should be excluded because people get really creepy about it sometimes. It doesn't take away from who she is as a character. She's not attractive because she's a chipmunk. It's because she has elements that would appeal to a certain demographic they were aiming for. They may not realize how creepy they are being in the middle of making it, but they are putting what they find attractive into these female characters. They are trying to make the viewer understand why the hero of the narrative would be so into a freaking chipmunk. I'm not trying to explore kinks today. That's a whole other can of worms. This is just showing you how much went into the design of the character. They wanted to make a chipmunk attractive, and they would certainly lean more into that in the comics. And then dive it back as the years went on. But even when they finally got the girl to dress herself and calm it down with the eyeshadow, fans still loved her anyway. Because design alone does not make the character. It's the character that makes the character. She needed a strong story and personality to go along with the looks. And they lean into certain tropes, like giving her the title of princess, which is a pretty standard female role in fiction, especially back then. I mean, Mario has a princess, why doesn't Sonic? But while there are occasions of her getting rescued, this is no princess. Princess Peach to Sonic's Mario. This is her Princess Leia to Sonic's Han Solo. Just can't stop stealing from Star Wars, can you, Sonic? It is amazing Disney doesn't own you yet. It's around this time I was noticing lady love interests in children's media with a bit more, well, personality. Immediately the Little Mermaid or Princess Jasmine popped to mind. But unlike Aladdin, Sally's relationship isn't built on a bed of lies, but we'll get into that in a little bit. My point is, they were finally giving some agency to the women in media focused on boys. They were more than just trophies to be won. A reward for a guy to win from another uglier guy. Sally is indeed royalty, but since her early childhood, she has lived in hiding. Robotnik overthrew her father, King Acorn, as the ruler of Mobotropolis, changing it to Robotropolis, building a machine empire, turning her people 
into robotic slaves and demolishing her world with pollution. Forced to go into hiding, she forms a ragtag group of freedom fighters to wage war against an overwhelming enemy that seems impossible to defeat, all while looking for clues to find her missing father. She has no special abilities. She is physically capable for, well, however physically capable a humanoid chipmunk can be, but even then she doesn't seem capable of doing actual chipmunk stuff like scampering up trees or... Oh, hello there. But she does have a knack for strategy, diplomacy, and a fair amount of technical know-how. She is a natural leader and has the wit to match her cocky blue boyfriend. Sally's motivation, her impetus, her drive, hell, her whole story can't exist without Sonic. And that's part of the reason why I feel like she works both as her own character and as a love interest to Sonic. But at the same time, I also understand this is why people dislike her so much. See, in terms of early Sonic cartoons and large chunks of the Archie series, this is no longer... This it's Sally's, and Sonic's just running around in it. Sonic's presence is no doubt incredibly important, but really, there's nothing here that screams Sonic design. Even the characters from the game seem radically different in this take of the Hedgehog's lore. Granted, as the Archie comics went on, I would get more of those game elements, but they felt really jarring in terms of design and narrative. It felt like the people making the comics didn't even play the games, let alone consult the folks who made the games. And that's not exactly new for early gaming media, but Sonic is unique here because even when the cartoon ended, the comic book carried on. And through all of these years, Sally's relevance never seemed to diminish. And while this is a bigger topic in terms of the entire world built by Sad AM and Archie, a lot of it still centers around Sally. It's hard not to see her as the character to represent all of this when so much of the original stuff was built with her in mind, not Sonic. Her world, as we know it, is generally run by a monarchy, the Kingdom of Acorn, and Sally is the heir apparent to the throne. King Curry is out of the picture. I, yes, that's actually Tim Curry's voice, and it's glorious. That is a royal order. Anyway, with Daddy out of the picture, Sally would be queen. But thanks to Robotnik taking over the kingdom, that's no longer the case. But if the Freedom Fighters take Robotnik out of the picture, it's going to be up to Sally to get the world back into order. She is technically the most important person in the world of Sonic Sat AM, not Sonic. It might be his name in the logo, but Sally is just as important of a character through the entire series of this cartoon. So you can understand how some fans can be all in for Sally, Mobius, and the Freedom Fighters because they went to such great lengths to build up this world, but also understand the frustration of those who came in as fans of the world and characters built by the games, then coming into the show and comics. Because even next to Tails, Sonic looks completely out of place compared to the rest of these characters. So yeah, as a kid, I have no problem telling you I did not like this show a whole lot. And honestly, revisiting it now, it's still not my favorite thing in the world. But that alone isn't why Sally is so divisive. Like I said, she was designed to be a love interest for Sonic. And a lot of people would rather see him shack up with a certain pink hedgehog. Or with someone else, or not at all. Sonic has had some dynamic shifts in personality through the years, and continuities. But generally, he is a funny, quick-witted, adventure-loving hedgehog. Early on in the States, they gave him a little more attitude and a plethora of catchphrases. And I've always been somewhat partial to him being a little more impatient and a little more full of himself. And I always loved having Sally around to help ground the guy, or put him in his place when he needed it. Even when they bicker, and being two very strong personalities they were bound to, they still wrote a wonderful chemistry between these two characters. While Sally is not impervious to rash indecisions or an emotional outburst every now and then, I mean, these are still teenagers, and depending on the whims of editors and writers, generally she is the level-headed leader of the group. Even without the romantic angle, Sonic is not exactly one to take orders well, and managing a personality like his would not be an easy task. I've said it before, but if there was anyone capable of having someone like Sonic stay in one place and be a team player, it's probably Sally. And even then, as writers of the cartoon have gone on to say, Sonic's still gonna do his thing when he feels like doing his thing. Sally's not gonna stop that. But if anyone's gonna get through to him, I think it's Sally. And I think that's because, despite the times they butt heads over strategy, there is still a mutual respect between the two of them. They both understand how essential 
essential the other is in the struggle to win back the world. And all of the Freedom Fighters matter, but Sonic and Sally are the power couple that keep it all together. Sally acting as field leader, understanding the strengths of her team and minimizing weaknesses, delegating tasks while doing what she can in terms of infiltration and sabotage, all of that frees up Sonic to cut loose and do his thing, taking out robots, mocking Robotnik, and being a bit of a show-off through the whole thing. That's not to say Sonic can't be a leader as well, or isn't in his own right, but I feel like his strengths as a character lie outside of delegation and bureaucracy. Sonic's never really come off as the bossy type to me. And considering the lack of a substantial cast back at the beginning of the franchise, Sad AM built characters that would bounce off well with a strong personality like Sonic's, and this group dynamic works, and splitting the leadership between Sonic and Sally just made sense. Sonic can still be free-spirited and do his own thing, and Sally has to be the one to tell him to rein it in and get down to business. He's the fun dad and she's the strict mom. And at the same time, Sally is allowed to explore the burden of leadership. They show her regretting choices that have cost her the people that have trusted her to make these decisions. Her team is a limited resource, and it's not like she has that much to work with. It's not just a matter of a soldier falling in battle. For every person they lose, that's another number in Robotnik's ranks. Certainly doesn't help that she can't just see them as numbers either. These are people. These are her friends, her subjects. These are the folks that are fighting for her. They're fighting to put her in power, and that weighs on her. They actually show a princess being a princess, and it's not always as glamorous as it's made out to be. It's more than just a title. She has to struggle and fight for the right to rule, and through all the hardship, she proves that she is fighting for more than just the title. She's fighting for the sake of her people, the sake of her planet. Sally is shown, time and again, that she makes her one hell of a leader, even in the moments where she doubts herself. And I feel like that's another reason why she works so well with Sonic, at least in the adaptations written around the two of them. Through all the grandstanding and debating, these two characters open up to each other and it feels real. That's something I feel like a lot of fans connected to when reading the comic or watching the show. There was a genuine effort to give layers to the relationship between these two woodland critters. So let's, uh, let's talk about Sonic the Hedgehog and relationships. Let's be honest, as cool as Sonic is, he'd be an absolute pain to date. Spontaneous, thrill-seeking, and while a hero to all, he can be a little self-centered. And through the games, that's part of the reason why he isn't hooking up with anyone. Out of all the weird mini-games, Dating Sim isn't one of them. No, that... no. None of that game counts. Sonic's later incarnations have him coming up with all the planes, keeping the peace between everyone, and generally just being way nicer than he used to be. And while I do prefer a little more edge to the character, if they're gonna keep insisting that he is a teenager with all these crazy cool powers, going through the years of Sonic media, I've just accepted this as Sonic growing up. And to continue my headcanon, part of that is because he was grounded by a capable chipmunk early on in his life, but more realistically, because Sega keeps tightening the grip on what Sonic's allowed to be. He and a few remaining cast members have absorbed the roles and personality traits that were once carried by other characters, and one of the big ones is Sally. Like I've said multiple times, she was designed from the very beginning to be a love interest to Sonic, and again, I think she makes a great companion to the character and easily the best in terms of romantic partners for the Hedgehog, thanks largely in part to the fact that, out of every canon, this is the longest and most fully fleshed out romantic relationship the Hedgehog's ever been in. Now, I don't think that's what makes these two work so well together, but I do think them working so well together is part of the reason why it was so fully explored. And yes, a lot of the Archie series revolved a lot of its plot around these two. Thanks to Sega, editors, and just bad writing, we did get a legendarily bad breakup, and not to mention all that exhausting romantic drama with this stupid skunk that looks like the Ninja Turtle action figure rendition of Pepe Le Pew. Archie focused a lot of drama on the romantic interests between all of these woodland critters, and that's to be expected among a group of teenagers, regardless of species, and you tend to invest in the relationships with characters in a long-running story that spans decades. Not all Sonic fans enjoyed this, but that's what this portion of the fanbase enjoyed, and well, I mean, come on, it was published by Archie. Is it really that surprising? And I should say right now, I'm fine with all of it as long as it's in a well-told story. I am totally fine with Sally ending up with the echidna, monkey, or even getting a little bit too into online dating, and I'm totally fine with Sonic ending up with the pink hedgehog, the DeviantArt OC mongoose, the Rule 63 Tails. Hell, even him and Shadow have a little something going on there. I mean, according to thirsty fans, Sonic has a Smash Bros roster full of smashing. And you know what? That might be a fun topic to explore a little more thoroughly at another time, but my point is I am fine 
line with those stories exploring these different relationships. That's part of the fun of all the drama and allows writers to go down more creative avenues. I still have my favorite coupling, and I am more than interested to get the perspectives of fans of other couplings, but you won't see me writing a bunch of angry, hateful nonsense in YouTube comments below a video like this, because I know the creator won't actually be bothered by any of it and will just end up deleting it without reading more than a few words and go on with his day as if it never happened. Because, as it turns out, those comments and the people making those hateful comments don't matter. Even with the fun cartoon animals, we grow invested in these relationships because, obviously, we care about these characters. And even when they are defined so well as their own personalities, such as the case with Sonic and Pals, we can't help but see a little of ourselves and what we look for in a relationship. Again, I'm not looking for literal chipmunks, but the person below all that beautiful brown fur. I do think Sally is the best partner for Sonic, but not a perfect one. We can't escape forced drama and teenage hormones, as written by adult men. And when you have two strong personalities clash, neither is going to back down. All that, and I can't be the only one who thought that a Sonic who settled down with a wife and kids and a king didn't make a whole lot of sense. Going back and reading old stories made me understand a little better why so many fans were happy to see this version of the character go the way of the Dodo. This is Sonic's inevitable future if he saves the world and shacks up with Sally. The fun-loving, free spirit that represented youthful rebellion ending up as the ruler of a monarchy? That's not the Sonic I know. And like it or not, no matter how wacky some writers can get, in a world with Princess Sally rising up and taking leadership with Sonic on her arm, that's where he's gonna end up. Sally's first priority is her people, her kingdom. She will rule and do what she has to do, no matter her own personal cost. She wants Sonic at her side, but if he would ever force her to make the choice between her responsibilities on the throne and running free, well, there is no question what choice she would make. This is why so many people are against her, not just in the form of a relationship with Sonic, but her existence in general. To many, this makes no sense for the world of Sonic. I wasn't very fond of the idea of King Sonic as a kid, but as an adult who has left his teenage years behind, I gotta admit, I've found a new appreciation of this version of the character. While it might not make a whole lot of sense for what I know Sonic to be, that doesn't mean it's not a fertile ground to tell some interesting stories. They do explore Sonic feeling like a fish out of water, his anxiety as a ruler. He does feel out of place on the throne, but he's got Sally there to help him along the way. And also, this is a Sonic that's now in his 40s. He saved the world and it's at peace. He can't stay a fun-loving drift forever. Eventually, he's got to grow up, and these stories are here to explore a world with an older Sonic, what he is like in his midlife, as a father and as a husband. And even in altered timelines, it's good to see things turn out well for the guy. I mean, this is probably his best possible outcome, and that future is with Sally. The extensive work on her design, personality, and background makes Sally a whole and complete person who comes into a relationship with another whole and complete person. She's not a fangirl. She's not here to swoon over Sonic. He doesn't need that. They could get along just fine without the other, but when together, they help the other shine. They complement what makes each other so great as people, but they won't back down when the other needs to be called out for making a mistake. And at the same time, neither is so stubborn to the point where they can't learn from the other. There are so many male protagonists in fiction that aren't allowed to settle down. Almost every form of media is afraid of a stable relationship. And I respect Sonic's sad AM for giving us a great example of a hero in a healthy relationship. Having fun moments with them sassing each other, and having a partner that allowed our hero to explore a wider range of emotions. Sonic does not speak to Sally the same way he speaks to any other character, and it never feels out of place for his character. This is a partner who has fought right alongside him in his adventures, and would walk away from a work day holding hands. Despite some misgivings I have with certain stories or writers or whatever else, by and large, I am pretty content with the portrayal of their relationship in the Archie comic series. Even if early on it was sort of hard to tell if they were an item, sometimes they would flat out say they were dating, only for a couple issues later to have this stupid skunk guy just flat out kiss Sally in front of Sonic because Penders was real weird with that whole skunk, man. Like, it was uncomfortable, honestly. Like, I, I read 
read that as a child, man. Like, what are you doing? And there are other times when we get to see the two of them just step away from all the action and drama and just be a couple. Not having to worry about saving the world for just a moment and enjoy each other's company. Even with that horrible breakup, I gotta tell you, during the battle with the second Death Egg, after years of dating around, all this will they won't they, in this moment where the fate of the world once again hangs in the balance, where the very outcome of the world rests on their shoulders, as they enter into a flying fortress they know they might not escape, with crazy dogfights, explosions, and violence happening all around them as they fly through the air, all that matters in that moment to them is each other. And even with a jab at that infamous slap, Sally responds by telling Sonic to shut up and give her a kiss for luck. And man, at that moment, I gave out a mighty, oh good for them. If I'm not mistaken, this was the last kiss to ever be shared between these two characters. And I'm talking in terms of real world printing, not the 30 years later storyline stuff. And I gotta tell you, it was satisfying. It didn't matter if this wasn't the main canon. It didn't matter if this never happened in the games. It felt earned. It felt right. Soon after this moment, Sally would be gunned down, and Sonic would hop back in time and save her life, but this wasn't a farewell to the character. This was a farewell to their relationship. Going forward, the comics would steer clear of romantic entanglements, and say what you want about Sega Mandates or Ian Flynn. For everything the series was, both bad and good, so much of the media revolved around not only Sonic, but also his main squeeze. And if Sega was going to shy away from icky cooties going forward, I appreciate that the bittersweet send-off was shared between these two. There is so much more to Sally than just her relationship to Sonic, but since the cartoon and comics spent so much time revolving around their relationship, relationship, it's impossible not to talk about. And despite anything else going forward, despite the fact that the book is now closed on this chapter of Sonic the Hedgehog, all this still happened, and I'm pretty content with how it played out. And fans of Sonic and Sally, you'll get the other fans telling you that it doesn't matter, it's a dead relationship, blah blah blah, so on and so forth. Whatever, man. Amy is never going to get this kind of attention. Doesn't matter what they say in panels or whatever other nonsense that they try to cling on to. You can love this, it happens. Happened, it's here, and nothing can take that away from you. I appreciate Sally for letting kids know that relationships are cool, for showing kids what a healthy relationship looks like, to show them that you should look for someone who loves you just as much as you love them. Relationships aren't a one-way street, and they take work, no matter how perfect they can be. It tells you to look for someone that will see past the face you put on for the rest of the world, who can see you at your worst, all your insecurities and faults, and still love you anyway but not so blindly that they don't call you out for your mistakes and help you grow from them, support you in the times you need it, that you don't give up at the first sign of a fight. You talk things through. You sometimes compromise. You grow. You live and learn. Together. This is why I appreciate Sally as a partner to Sonic more than I do Amy, who came into the franchise as a fangirl and got hilariously aggressive about her love for the guy for a minute there, and now downplays it and is even acting like a certain chipmunk a lot more these days, but I don't know, man, I feel like Amy deserves better than that. She shouldn't have to transform who she is to better suit Sonic, and I really think it's reductive to both of these characters to debate which one should get weird with the spiky Cyclops, and I also think it's generally very silly to get worked up over it either way. But yeah, obviously I have my opinions on the matter, and I'm not gonna pretend like I don't. And I still love the character of Amy Rose. And I do find this specific conversation interesting enough that, again, this needs to be explored further in its own episode. So we'll get back around to it when we get back around to it. Besides, I don't want to interrupt all the essays that Son Amy shippers are currently tapping away in the comments, so go nuts, you little weirdos. But maybe you don't care about any of that. Maybe this exhausting amount of time I spent on this relationship is the very reason you don't want Sally in the video games. Sure, the old cartoon and Archie comics let creators explore Sonic's character in ways the games never could, <laughs> despite some efforts. And that's where they need to stay. This should not be the focus of this franchise. And you know what? Fair enough. We've never had Sally in the mainline games, and it's likely we will never have her in the mainline games. It's likely this character, let alone her relationship to Sonic, is finally dead and buried. It had its place, and it needs to stay in its place place. I am more than satisfied with what we got in the comics, and honestly, I'm more than astonished that it not only lasted as long as it did, but got so damn good on the back half of its existence. Sally's relationship with Sonic has been more thoroughly explored than it has, or ever will be, between
me any other two characters in this franchise. I am more than happy with what we got and can live with the idea that we won't ever see her again. I am a realist, but I'm also an optimist. Because now, I'm going to tell you why she not only could show back up, but she damn well deserves it. I have seen, time and again, people flat out say they hate this character and her presence would actively make the Sonic games worse. And before I continue on, if you're leaving a comment saying she isn't legally allowed to appear in the games or at the very least Sega isn't going to risk her presence in the game, shush, just shut up. If you aren't aware, Ken Penders, longtime writer of the Archie series, got into some legal battles between Archie and Sega after he was copywriting some of the characters he created for the Sonic comic book and a whole mess with Sonic Chronicles. It's a nightmare. Thanks to Archie's miraculous ineptitude, Penders actually won. And going forward from the lawsuit, the companies were not allowed to use any character he created. And because of this, fans assume that he just made up everything in Western Sonic media. Well, I'm gonna remind you guys, he did didn't come up with the core premise. He didn't come up with the Freedom Fighters, and certainly didn't come up with Sally Acorn. They didn't end the Archie book right after the lawsuit wrapped up. They jarringly removed characters that Penders created and then rebooted the whole thing just for good measure. They removed any sort of risk well before the Archie run ended. There is no official word why Sega ended their relationship with Archie, but it's heavily rumored they did it because they were pissed off with how horribly Archie botched what should have been an easy win for them. Sega has full ownership over the core Freedom Fighters, and if they were that concerned about legal backlash, they probably wouldn't have put Sonic Spinball on the Genesis Mini. Technically, Sally has shown back up in official licensed Sega products and compilations that won't even include Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Let that sink in. Sega isn't afraid of using the long lost chipette. It is, quite simply, Sega of Japan never really acknowledging the elements brought into the franchise from the western side of things. That's not an official word, mind you. Sega has not flat out said, I don't like your stupid fan characters. But the writing's on the wall here. Sega of America loved Sally back in the day. They actively kept Archie from killing off the poor girl during the endgame arc because the comic was doing well and they wanted more. She was one of the main mascots of that weird Sega world. Oh dear, Sally, you've seen better days. She had merch, the whole nine yards. And Sonic Side AM only lasted two seasons. And Sega World certainly didn't do too much better. And it's incredible that the Sonic comic lasted as long as it did, considering how badly it was lambasted by anyone who wasn't already a fan. But miraculously, despite all of this, Sally and the other Freedom Fighters endured. And it's no thanks to Sega of Japan. And you know what? Early on, I get it. Like I said, as a kid, I wasn't completely down with the cartoon and comic, really only taking it in because it had Sonic in it. But the game still remained king, even if King Sonic wasn't a comic. You, you get it. So yeah, when I first heard that a game based on Sonic Set AM was roundly shot down by Yuji Naka and his team, I got it. That demo footage showed me the very reason why I, at one point, wanted all of this American crap to steer clear of the game series. Slow, clunky, and Sonic is hiding from robots? How much of Sonic and his franchise has to slow down for Sally to keep up? I gave up on the Archie books completely. I gave up on Sally and the rest of the extended Western cast. And after 2006, I was just about done with the franchise altogether. But that interest didn't stay away for too long. And one day while passing through a bookstore, I picked up a Sonic comic off the shelf just out of morbid curiosity. Issue 160. And while it wasn't perfect, I was noticing the art style was more consistent, more in line with Sonic as a whole. And while still dripping with melodrama, the dialogue was much quippier, the characters more fleshed out. And every now and then going forward, I would pick up another random Sonic comic and miraculously, the book seemed to keep getting better. And before I knew it, I was back in. I had expanded my taste since I was a kid. I loved this stuff so much that I became a student of it, crafting my own stories and studying from a wide range of the medium. I had set plenty of my own standards of what makes a good story, and amazingly, the Sonic comic was actually compelling. Not just for Sonic, and not just for kids, but as a story. And I'd realized that all these characters that I dismissed as a kid were actually pretty great in the right hands. What is truly brilliant about Flynn's run on the back end of the Archie series is how well this team managed to merge all these disparate elements of this chaotic franchise. And since they understood these characters on such a fundamental level, they truly shined. 
It's not perfect, but it's better than it has any right to be. And finally, for the first time, even growing up and understanding that there were different versions of this one franchise, I saw that it could work together, all of it, at once, and in turn, build out Sonic's world in ways I just couldn't see as a kid. Just as I wanted more game elements in the cartoons, I'm sure there were fans that wanted more of the cartoon characters in the games. And these later Archie issues gave us both. They didn't shy away from all the relationship nonsense, but where it was once intolerable, it was now engaging. And even after they stripped away any trace of Ken Penders and made Sonic the celibate little incel he is today, they were still telling good stories. Because as it turns out, all you really need to make Sally or any of these other characters work well together with Sonic is just a good writer. Sega does this crap all the time and it drives me crazy. There are all these elements, all these amazing creative people on their payroll, all this history in this franchise, and if you just bring them together, you could make something amazing. Amazing. You could make this series shine in ways that Mario never could, would never dare to. Sonic needs to get it together with the 3D games, and that's a whole other topic we've discussed multiple times. But in terms of lore and characters, they have everything they need to make Sonic compelling, and they don't utilize it to its full capacity. A long time ago, it made sense to keep these elements separate, and in some ways, I'm glad to see them blossom into their own things. And in other cases, when it comes to the Sonic franchise, which we'll discuss at another time, it might even make sense to keep some stuff separate. But again, in terms of the story, there are some glaring holes that could have easily been filled. And yes, I'm talking about Sonic Forces again, deal with it. I've said it before, many times. Sonic Forces is a frustrating slapdash mess of wasted potential. Top to bottom, Mania came out in the same year, and even with all the whining children complaining about the game now? Thank goodness Mania turned out as good as it did. Thank goodness the movie got Tyson Hess on board to redesign that hedgehog. You drama babies think the franchise is in a sorry state now? Imagine a world where we had nothing but Sonic Forces. Because as stubborn as Sega of Japan has been before, that could have very easily been the reality. On top of that, the IDW book is also doing fine. And all these projects? Well, you can thank some passionate Americans for getting that done. I'm not trying to say all of your problems can be solved with America. I mean, look at the state of the country. Not saying that at all. And from my understanding, the writers of the recent Sonic games are American as well. And, uh, well, j just yikes. My point is that when you get talented people who give a crap about this franchise on board, it doesn't matter where they came from. You bring in these elements, and you bring in these people, you have them work together, and you get some incredible results. Outside of the gameplay, Forces is such a frustration to us fans because we have seen this narrative done well from the very beginning, and Sega just doesn't want to use these characters doesn't even want to acknowledge them. We don't get to see this big war take place. We don't have any reason to care about this nameless world. And we have these characters just filling in roles that make no sense for them. Or at the very least, it would have been really cool to see how these characters took up these drastic changes. It's jarring, it's poorly written, it's not good. With the world taking over, the stakes this high, and the games still don't have the courage to put a name on the world. They're so afraid of defining any of these characters. They're all placeholders. Wouldn't it have been great if this world had a name? It had a history that we cared about? Cultures and societies that inhabited some of these overused zones? All of this would have made the takeover of Eggman that much more dire. I mean, right now, apparently they're two separate worlds, and the games aren't even telling us that. We have to get that from interviews and crap like that. And it sure as hell would have been a great time for a certain chipmunk to lead this resistance force. I understand why people don't want Sally in the games. They don't want Sonic to focus on romance. They don't want the entire narrative to revolve around her, because so much of the narrative that she's been involved with has revolved around her. And I get that. Trust me, I grew up despising all of this stuff. But are we so creatively bankrupt not to see the potential flavor her mere existence invites? I'm not saying having her here would have improved the writing. She wouldn't have saved the game's story. I'm just saying that adding a few simple elements would have improved things. It still sprinkles on a turd, yes, but, you know, it's still a step up. And on the flip side, the idea IDW comics, to me, feel like a cupcake without the sprinkles. It's well written, the characters are engaging, and once again, it shows what talent can do, even if they have to deal with a mess like Sonic Forces. But as much as I love the Metal Virus Saga, a post-apocalypse story that allowed us to explore the darkest days of some of these beloved characters without it feeling jarringly out of place, this whole thing still feels empty. It's obvious this was meant for the more robust Mobius of the Archie comics, instead of this vague empty world with like 
three named towns. We haven't been with these versions of the characters long enough to feel the full impact of this event. As fun as it was, still felt horribly dragged out, and the stakes would have been so much higher in the Archie run. The Metal Virus challenges our heroes in ways that pushes them to their limits, but it's still based off elements that came from the days of Sonic Sat AM. I love Amy, and I don't hate how she's portrayed in IDW, but she is obviously filling in the blue boots of Sally. This should have been a test pushing her limits, instead of the ever-changing Amy. The story would have mattered so much more in the continuity it was originally crafted for. And Sally deserves that because she was also at the center of a story that explored the inverse of all of this in the Archie run. Remember when I mentioned that sappy smooch? Well, right after that, Sally was shot down, probably for getting too close to the bird feeder. That's for my chickadees, you vermin! <laughs> Sonic managed to retcon this instance, only for something potentially much worse to take its place. Sonic messing around with time had hefty repercussions. See, Sonic and Sally infiltrated the Death Egg because Eggman had built a world roboticizer. And if you've been paying attention, you know that's a big machine that will turn all the Mobians into mindless robotic slaves. Well, Sonic did manage to save Sally, and Sally did manage to stop the machine, but at the cost of her humanity. chipmunk I don't know. She couldn't stop the machine, but she could isolate it to a single point on her. And while she did save the world and really put a dent on the death egg, from the debris crawled out Mecha Sally. This was so much better than a one-off story that used the same premise years ago. This is so much better than attempting to kill the character. This took all of Sally's skills and brought it over to the other team, and then souped it all up in a robotic body. This arc explored the relationship Sally had not just with Sonic, but her relationship with this world they spent decades building up. Seeing all these old friends, family, leaders, people in general, seeing Mobius react to a roboticized Sally, using her tactics mind to manipulate emotions and exploit weaknesses? This was powerful stuff. We got to see just how much of the world she helped bring together and show how much of a hero Sonic and Tails and Amy truly were, and how horrible of a villain Robotnik truly can be. Instead of killing her off and being done with it, he weaponizes her, sends her to the people she cherished most in the world, both as a calculated tactical move, but also out of petty revenge for all the trouble she caused him, and how much pain pain it would cause Sonic to face off against the love of his life. Sally might indeed be at the center of so much of Western Sonic media, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. In the right hands, you can make one hell of a narrative. And honestly, that also sounds like a way better game than Sonic Forces. I'm not the biggest fan of the cornier elements of Sonic stories, be it games or elsewhere. But just because you dislike something doesn't mean you have to throw it all out. Flynn's run on Archie revitalized a lot of elements I despised and managed to merge them beautifully with a lot of the elements I already love from the games. And even without Pender characters, I honestly don't know why Sonic games have never taken advantage of that. Sally doesn't need to be a playable character. The plot doesn't need to completely revolve around her. Just being the voice and the earpieces of our heroes at Resistance HQ would have been plenty. And you know what? Screw it. I'm also down with the other Sonic Extreme. I am super down to go all in with with Sally and the Freedom Fighters. Make them the core element of a narrative. Make Sonic Adventure 3 with the different Freedom Fighters as playable characters. Make Sonic and Sally an item, or even just hint at the history between the two. Sonic and Sally were once close, but Sally had to tend to a kingdom, and Sonic had to run off to save the world on his many adventures. I would play that game, or I would at least be interested if they alluded to something in the past. That would have been awesome. I'm just spitballing here. Also, I'm coming up with, with video ideas. I gotta go write these down. However little you used them, or made a whole game about them. As long as you have talented storytellers and game designers behind the scenes, you can create something brilliant. You can elevate this franchise in ways it's never done before. That's all I'm trying to say here. Yes, another Sonic video where the ultimate point is, please make better Sonic games. I completely understand why people dislike this character. I have barely scratched the surface here, and we will explore more as we dive more into Sonic speed reading and other Sonic media. But the goal of this video was to give you a 
little history lesson, share my thoughts on why I enjoy Sally as a character and as a love interest to Sonic, and ask you to be just a little more open-minded than just throwing the baby out with a bathwater. I know the games can do fine without Sally, and they have more pressing concerns than adding in more characters, but when you look at what the talented folks who know what they're doing are doing, I truly don't understand why you don't bring these people in together to create something truly special. I do know there are an outspoken few individuals out there who would, understandably, keep you actively disinterested in this portion of the franchise, but I do implore you to ignore those toxic idiots out there and just give some of these stories a shot and get creative. See how much better Sonic's world can be when it's not so vague. I mean, can you imagine if they never let Harley Quinn be anything but Joker's sidekick in the Batman animated series? Yeah, that's where she originated. She wasn't originally a comic book character. And yes, I know she's a little overplayed nowadays, but I think we'd all be a little worse off without her expanding into other media. And same thing with Sally. I truly don't understand why you wouldn't want to take advantage of these elements that have survived such a rocky history. And maybe she won't make a comeback, but I'm still gonna root for her. Because Sally was a great female role model in a franchise designed to focus on boys. She was a love interest that explored a healthy relationship, and she was also a survivor. Through the hardships in her life, she continued to fight what seemed to be a battle she could never win. And despite everything going against her nowadays in the real world, despite the very company that owns her trying to erase her very existence, despite never being in a mainline game, she's still been here for decades. And even when they finally closed the book on the record-breaking run of the Archie comic series, she still endures to us fans. And instead of trying to shut fans down, maybe take a look at why she has mattered for so long. Because one way or another, she'll be back. Because you can't keep a good freedom fighter down. Toot toot, Sonic Warriors, and rally for Sally. Guys, thank you so much for sticking around for this episode. This was alarmingly long. I did not expect to spend this much time talking about a sexy chipmunk, but here we are. I need to take a second here to thank the amazing patrons you're seeing on screen right now. These amazing people who stick by me, who support me, and will even watch videos when they're not related to Sonic. I did a whole thing about games where you play sharks. Why aren't you watching that, you lunatics? Seriously though, guys, thank you so much for the support. It means the world to me, and I mean, I, I, what, what else can I say besides thank you? I'll keep trying to improve. I'll keep trying to produce more stuff for you. I'll keep trying to provide content that deserves the money you're giving me. All right, that's enough rambling from me. Thank you guys so much. I'm excited to see the comments for this particular video. I'm sure they're going to get interesting. And I'm excited to come back to this topic eventually, because I've just skimmed the surface when it comes to Sally. There's so much to get into. The Archie books are so, so pervasive, and... I did not give enough examples of why this character is so rad. There is a lot left to get into. And there are a lot of other Freedom Fighters and a lot of other Sonic characters we gotta talk about. And, well, if you sat through all of this rambling, I guess I should at least leave you with something. Toot toot.